Welcome, everybody. It's very nice to have such a large crowd again today. Very nice to see everybody. You're very welcome to be here, whether it's your first time or your umpteenth time. You're very welcome. As John said, we are today going through our series of Hebrews. We're in the, our second week. So last week, John showed us from just the first three, four verses, really, um, how, um, how Jesus was fully God, how Jesus is better than everything else that came before him. Um, John mentioned that Hebrews starts with long ago, because whilst the book of Hebrews was written at a specific time, talking about the time after Jesus, actually there's a lot more history to that. There's a lot of things which have been before. Um, the, Jesus was there at the very beginning. Um, Hebrews tells us Jesus is God's son, he's God's heir, he's the creator of all things as well. Uh, it tells us he's the radiance of God's glory, which means that he is shiny, which... You have to watch last week now on YouTube <laughs> to get that reference. Um, he says that he is the exact image of God's nature, and he upholds the universe. And something I learned last week is that that phrase in Greek, the exact image, the exact likeness, uh, is the Greek word character, which is literally like a coin stamp. So as a coin has an image of the queen on, it's her exact likeness for legal purposes and and in representation purposes, Jesus is like that for God. Jesus is the imprint. He's the stamp of God. He's the exact likeness of God. Um, and that, yes, the whole of Hebrews shouts that Jesus is better. His work is complete, and he is sat down at the right hand of God. So Jesus is fully God, but today we're looking at the fact that Jesus is also fully human as well. Oh dear, hang on. That is the wrong image. That is not what we mean by Jesus is fully human. That he's some sort of macho tank of a guy who did everything by himself. No, that's not true. Okay, Jesus was fully God and he was fully man. Not because he did everything himself. But, let's have a nice Venn diagram. Because we have two things going on. Okay, we have God and we have man. God is fully God. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's eternal. Mankind is fully man. He's a created thing. He is an image bearer as well. So whereas Jesus is the exact likeness of God, we are just image bearers. Sometimes we resemble God more than other times. Um, we were created to do so anyway. But man is mortal. They were created to be together, the Garden of Eden. We are together. We are walking with God. But man's sin separates us. I says sin, if you can't read that down the middle. Um, Man's sin separated us from our creator. It, it stopped us being one. It stopped us having that freedom to walk with God in the garden. It's got in the way. The good news is that Jesus... Oh, no. Oh, formatting error. I apologize. Uh, Jesus both brought God and mankind back together, and he is the intersection between God and mankind. He is fully human, and he is fully man. So let's, uh, let's look at some more of Hebrews today. Uh, we're not going through Hebrews verse by verse because we'd be here for many, many years. So today we turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, we're going to be looking from verse 5 to um, about verse 15 and then we'll also skip to Hebrews chapter 4 for a little bit as well. So if you turn to Hebrews chapter 2, if you look at verse 5, um, we can see something about the role of man. So before we even get into um, Jesus is fully human as well as being fully God. What does it even mean to be man? Well, in verses 5 to 7, um, the writer of Hebrews reminds the listeners that God did not create the world for angels, but he created it for us. He created it even for mankind to rule. In Genesis 1 verse 28, God says to Adam and Eve, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Mankind was originally made to rule the earth in a good way, to, um, to have dominion, to subdue, to fill it. Everything was in mankind's control, as given by God in the Garden of Eden. But by Genesis 3, just two chapters later, we have relinquished that control to Satan. In the Garden, we've given up, the Garden of Eden in the fall, we've given up our servanthood to God, and our, um, our following him, our closeness, our freedom to walk with God, we've given that up 
and we've declared Satan and ourself to be our master. We've given up that status of ruling to somebody else by not doing what we're supposed to. Um, just before I continue, those, those words, things like subjected and subdue and dominion, they all have quite kind of negative connotations, don't they? It would be strange if you um, used things like dominion in a positive way, perhaps, these days. Well, remember, they, they're not meant to be those ways, are they? God created um, us to subject the world, uh, to, be, to, be, to subject the world, because the world was to be our subjects, as in a good king ruling things, as in there's a rightful order, there's a rightful um, lineage of, of things, how things are supposed to be. Subdue, things like tame. Okay, when you tame something, it's not a bad thing necessarily, or it, it doesn't have to be. Um, I like to think of people like Ernest Shackleton or Robert Scott, Roald Amelton, uh, the original Antarctic explorers. Perhaps you could say that they subdued the South Pole, they subdued the Antar Antarctica in their kind of getting to grips with it and, and it not being such a large thing anymore. Um, the dominion, again, as in your realm, that's your area, that's what you're supposed to look after, that's what you're supposed to care for. If you have a dominion over something in a positive way, you're supposed to look after it and care for it. Nowadays, those words mean slightly different things, don't they? Uh, verses 8 to 10 of chapter 2, they, they follow through on this theme. They, they clarify this theme. The Son of Man, Jesus, was to rule finally. So, it was created for mankind, but we sacrificed that. We gave up our kind of position of ruling to Satan, but it is promised that Jesus... Um, will be in control of everything. He has rescued the earth. Everything has been declared to be in Jesus' control. He says, doesn't he? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, etc. Um, Jesus rescued the world from Satan's grip for us. But in verse 8, we read that at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. We live in an in-between stage, don't we? Jesus has been crowned and he is triumphant, he's victorious, but the old ruler has not quite been banished from the kingdom yet. There's a kind of disparity, isn't there? Um, we live in the now and the not yet. We have access to heaven now, but it is not yet fully here. Um, we know, and so does Satan, that he does not have authority over us anymore, but he does still have power and influence. He is still corrupting the world around us. He's, he still has his way sometimes. Jesus has all authority, and as his servants we can share some of that authority. He gives that to us. He tells us on his authority to go and make disciples of all nations. Um, Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, after sending out the 72, they, they, they go out, they, um, you know, they tell people about Jesus, they, that the kingdom of heaven is coming, they perform miracles, they cast out demons, and um, they, they come back to Jesus going, this stuff's amazing, this is great. Uh, Jesus says to them, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So even in the authority which he gives us, he says, don't be pleased about the authority. Be pleased that I have rescued you. It's not, that's not the thing to, um, to, to praise me over or to, to kind of enjoy. Don't be surprised that you have authority when I've given it to you. Be surprised and be joyful that you've been rescued in the first place. Um, so in our in-between stage, um, we, we know, um, it says, we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of his sacrificial and redeeming death. Um, by the grace of God, Hebrews says that he has tasted death for everyone, everyone who chooses his grace. God's plan was that he for, whom, he for whom and by whom all things exist should make the founder of our safe salvation, Jesus, perfect through suffering. And verse 11 likewise tells us a little bit more. It tells us a bit about this salvation. Because Jesus and us have one source, God, um, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers, which is crazy, isn't it? Just think for a moment, imagine for me, if you had a, a pretend brother, or maybe a real brother, but if you had a brother who, um, however much they tried, they could not stop getting arrested. They never did anything massively wrong. 
They never you know, committed some huge crimes, but they kept getting arrested for petty crime. Um, however well-intentioned they were, however much they promised you, it's all right, I won't do it again. I'm going to turn over a new leaf this time. A week goes by, a day goes by, a month goes by, they get arrested again. They always turn back to crime and mischief. Would you be ashamed of that brother? I think it's worth asking because we are that brother, aren't we? We are that brother. Sometimes, no matter how hard we try, we still turn to, not petty crime, but to maybe petty sin. Oh no, we did that thing again. Oh no, I ended up gossiping. Oh no, I maybe ended up stealing. Maybe it's slightly more serious. But... Um, <laughs> Petty crime. I know. I'm, those in line, I'm not condoning the theft. Um, so, this is how... So, would you be ashamed of that brother? Because Jesus is not ashamed of that brother when it's us. Right? Um, yeah. So, verse 11 says, Because Jesus was one of us, uh, he's given up his eternal mantle. Think of what we read about in um, 1 John. Think of the transfiguration when he's on top of the mountain and the disciples see him for slightly more who he really is and go, whoa, this is incredible. Uh, think of the way that demons respond to him when he cast them out. Um, you may have never noticed that nearly every single time Jesus casts out a demon, he first says to them, be quiet, because they keep telling everyone who he is. Um, if you think of the, the, the guy up on the cliffs, near, what's it called? Yeah, that guy, Gerasini, somewhere near there. Somewhere around where Jesus was ministering. There's that guy who's um, lost his mind. He's, he's living in the tombs, and he's possessed by a legion of demons, uh, so, it, so it says. And the first thing they say is, Son of the Most High, what do you want with us? Please don't banish us, because they know who Jesus is. They know what authority Jesus has. So Jesus gave up that eternal mantle, and he instead um, inhabited, he claimed, just an earthly mantle. He considers us brothers and sisters. He did not rely on the fact that he was fully God, but he relied on the fact that God is fully God. And so he, us and him, Hebrews says, have the same source. So Jesus was fully human too, because of all of those things I just said, to summarize. <laughs> Next, we're going to turn to verses 14 to 18. Um, verses 14 to 18 of chapter 2 elaborate a little bit more fully on Jesus' humanity and why it was necessary. They say, Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the devil and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. That's us, that's humans. Uh, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propiti propiti propitiation, <laughs> propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Since we are flesh and blood, Jesus also became flesh and blood. He really was fully and physically human. That is important. He partook of the same things as us. Jesus was hungry. Jesus ate food. Um, Jesus drank wine. Jesus got tired. He needed rest and sleep. He needed uh, time by himself and with just his disciples. Jesus got peopled out too. It's allowed, you're allowed to be peopled out sometimes. Um, he relied on prayer a lot. Very frequently we read that Jesus was you know, something's happening with the disciples, and they're like, where's Jesus? Oh, he's up the mountain praying. He'll be back in a minute. Or Jesus returns from praying, and something has happened, and he, you know, he has to teach them again. He's always teaching them, isn't he? Um, Jesus uh, trained for 30 years before starting his ministry, approximately. You know, he was a carpenter for some of that time. He was studying scripture for some of that time. He was learning who he was in God at that time. Um, but Jesus partook of the same things as us. Um, I know we've probably spoken about it a few times, but it really is worth watching The Chosen. If you haven't seen The Chosen, or if you don't know what it is, ask one of us. Uh, the Chosen is a really wonderful to watch, kind of, I guess it's a TV show, though it's not on TV TV. Um, it really shows the personality, the personableness, the humanity of Jesus. It just brings it across in a really helpful to understand way. Um, 
it helps you see kind of what C.S. Lewis used to say about Jesus either being a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. It helps you see that what scripture says, it's based on scripture, it helps you see that, well, because of everything else Jesus said, he must have been one heck of a liar to lie about everything all the time. Probably not true, not likely to be true. Um, he's probably not a lunatic either because of the way he was with people. The fact that thousands of people came to hear him talk. The fact that he had 12 close friends. Do you know anyone else with 12 close friends? Um, he must have been a genuine good person. He must have been a loving person, a kind person, and probably also quite humorous. Um, yeah, verse 17 continues, as we said, it's, uh, he, he had to be made in every respect like us. In every respect, like us, his brothers. When he says brothers, remember he's talking about us, his brothers and sisters in Christ. He, um, yeah. So, I hear you say, all right, I believe that Jesus was fully human. I believe the Bible says that. But why? Why does it matter? Well, the answer is in these verses as well. First of all, Jesus was fully human so that his suffering and his death would really be death. It wouldn't be some falsity. It wouldn't be some... I died, but I'm God, so it didn't really count. He died a human death, the same death that we experience. The same death that verse 15 says, um, fear of which subjects us to slavery of self and Satan. Jesus was fully human to experience and save us from a fully human death. It also says, um, because he was not purposed to help the angels who fell, but he's to help the humans who fell. He, um, verse 16, he isn't, it's not angels that he helps, but it's the offspring of Abraham. It's us. It's his brothers and sisters. It's his humans, which he has um, chosen to save. I, um, I knew a great man. He's died now, but I knew a great Christian man who once said that angels are in awe of us because we obey Jesus. We, we follow God. We, we have faith without sight. But they have sight, so that they almost don't have faith. They, they, they can't understand what it is to follow God without knowing who he is, without seeing him fully. So, make of that what you will. But I always, I think of that sometimes and it makes me ponder. Um, angels knew and saw God, and yet some of them chose not to follow him. They chose to follow Satan. We don't yet know or see God, and yet we do choose him because he first chose us. We love him because he first loved us. Um, and it also says that Jesus was fully human so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. I'm not going to say that word again. To make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus had to be like us so that he could fully understand us. So that he could get us. Um, unlike certain politicians at the moment who are being accused of being very out of touch. Poor people can't cook. So they say, and other such untruths. Um, they, they're being painted as very much out of touch with what it is. Which, to be fair, I understand that they're very out of touch sometimes. Because, in my opinion, they get a ludicrous salary for not a lot. Anyway, um, but Jesus is very much in touch with what it is to be human. Okay? He was born um, to, a, to a, a normal, roughly normal family. Um, he was a carpenter, he had a trade, he had to balance reading the Bible and working at the same time. He had to balance a lot of different things. Jesus is very much in touch with what it is to be human. Because Jesus suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Hang on a minute. Did that just say Jesus suffered when he was tempted? Does that mean Jesus found temptation hard? Yes! I don't think you can call temptation suffering if you don't find it hard. Um, we are allowed to find it hard as well. Is temptation a suffering for you? Because it was for Jesus. Yes, Dad is talking. <laughs> um, we are allowed to find it hard as well. In fact, I would go so far as to say that temptation only stops being a suffering when either it's no longer tempting because you, you've moved on from that, yay sanctification, or because you give in and it no longer becomes temptation, it just becomes guilt. So if you're suffering with temptation, that's in some ways a good thing. Jesus did too. Keep suffering with it and in a good way, one day it won't be suffering anymore. So, in summary, Jesus was fully human too to help humans fully. 
in every way possible. Uh, finally, we're going to skip to uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Now we know that Jesus was fully human. Now we've seen why he was fully human. We're going to finish with what are the consequences of Jesus being fully human and fully God. Well, verses 14 to 16 of Hebrews chapter 4 say, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Amen? We have a high priest who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Hooray! He won. Jesus conquered temptation. He can show us how to do that too. He can lead us through that. He can provide the exact help we need at the exact time we need if we just ask and obey, if we just ask and trust in him. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. He's finished what he's done. He called out on the cross and it is finished. And he has sat at the right hand of the Father, sat down because his work is done. He still prays for us. He still intercedes with us. It's a bit wibbly wobbly, timey wimey, but his work is finished. Um, I know that I've done entire sermons before on who Jesus is, as in who who you think of, who you see in your head when you see the word Jesus. Do you think of um, compassionate Jesus, perhaps raising Jairus's daughter from dead? Uh, do you think of miraculous Jesus feeding the 5,000? Uh, do you think of baby Jesus at Christmas or the crucified Jesus at Easter? Is he the miracle maker or the good teacher? Or is he, John knows where I'm going with this, is he the Jesus that we see in Revelation chapter 1? If we very, very briefly take a slight detour to Revelation chapter 1, um, John is um, in the spirit and he has a vision. And he turns around to see the voice that was speaking to him. And when he turned, he saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone dressed like a son of man. Someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Wow, that's a real picture of Jesus, isn't it? That is very different to Jesus meek and mild, or Jesus the miracle maker. That, sure, Jesus was those things when he was on earth as a fully human and fully God. But now, he is sat on the throne, finished what his work was. And he is victorious and glorious, dressed in a robe like a king with a golden sash. Um, that's the opposite of girding your loins. You know, when, you, when you wore a robe in the past, you used to lift it up and tie it in a special way to gird your loins to get you ready to be able to run. Otherwise, you trip up on your own cloak. But when you've finished your work, you ungird your loins and look, you just wear your normal robe um, with a sash around his, rest, his chest because he has finished. Hair, white like wool, white as snow. He's pure, he's holy. His eyes like blazing fire, his feet like bronze, and his voice like the sound of rushing waters, and out of his mouth a double-edged sword. Hebrews also says, doesn't it, that the word of God is living and active, sharper than the double-edged swords. Uh, Jesus' words are sure and trustworthy, and his face shining like the sun in all of its brilliance. Remember, that's the... Um, that's a strong Mediterranean sun, isn't it? That's not, that's not the Welsh sun just making it through the clouds on a nice summer's day. No, that's, a, that's an Israeli or Mediterranean sun in its, all of its um, full strength. So that guy, he can sympathize with our weaknesses. That's crazy, right? He was tempted like us, but triumphed. So he can help us triumph as well. He says, oh, the Bible says we are more than conquerors in Christ, doesn't it? So we have a Jesus who really was human, who really did die, who relied on the same source as us, on God, who suffered temptation but prevailed, who is merciful and faithful and understanding and in touch with us, 
and he knows what we go through. What's our response? Well, you'll see underlined in Hebrews 4, uh, verses 14 to 16, that there are some things which we are told to do. Okay, we are commanded as well. We are told to hold fast to our confession. A Christian is someone who confesses that they need God's help and has received it. A Christian is someone who confesses they need God's forgiveness and receives it. Um, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow are ours. So hold fast to your confession. And when things get tough, don't run from Jesus or don't run from his church because Jesus was fully human too. He knows what you're going through. When stuff gets difficult, hold fast to your confession. He, um, Hebrews tells us to, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace. Yes, we can draw near to that guy with confidence because he is for us, because he calls us brothers. Um, isn't that amazing? I think it is. And we can receive mercy and grace to, and to help in our time of need. Mercy and grace need to be actively received. So practice receiving gifts, practice receiving mercy and grace. And pray for them, thank God for them, and walk as if you have them, because God has given them to you. Wonderful. Thank you.